My name is Joe Brown at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. And I want to thank you all for coming to this uh, final presentation for our class, CEE 4803, uh, Environmental Technology in the Developing World. So uh, this has been a great class. I'm really incredibly proud of all the hard work that the students have put in. Uh, this semester, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I just want to briefly uh, acknowledge some of the some of the people we need to thank uh, here, including um, the Joe S. Mundy uh, Global Learning Endowment, which uh, which generously provided uh, financial support for us to undertake this work. Um, the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, especially uh, communications, for uh, for supporting our work as well. Um, also, Dr. Mike Bergen of Duke University, who uh, graciously uh, both helped design the course and then provided really critical field guidance and support uh, for the students, and really, really uh, has really been a, a, a key player in, in the class the entire semester. I really want to thank him. And uh, Dr. Jahan Kim of Yale University now, formerly of Georgia Tech, uh, who, uh, who was, I guess, the intellectual godfather of this course, and he really, uh, you know, had, had you had the vision for what this course could be, and he really um, uh, was, was a, a great support as well. Um, our local host, Mark, uh, Dr. Marcos Andrade of uh, the Universidad Mayor de San Andres, um, and his colleagues in the Department of Physics at, at the university. Um, Dr. Ruben Mamani of Engineers in Action, um, and, and his colleagues uh, in Bolivia provided uh, enormous support for the, for the work, as well as uh, Dr. Dario Acha, uh, Noelia Rincon at the Laboratorio de Calidad Ambiental uh, at UMSA, um, and so many others who helped us throughout, throughout this uh, really challenging course. Two people who are not on this slide, however, that I really want to recognize and thank uh, are, are um, Aaron Bivens and Heidi Breland, who are the TAs for the course, who really um, went way above and beyond throughout the semester to provide support to the student teams. And, and um, you know, these are basically unpaid TAs, and they were rock stars. I think we'll all agree. So uh, join me in thanking them. You guys, you guys did great. You guys did great. Um, so, so I won't say anything else. I think, I think both presentations we have lined up uh, uh, really are um, uh, stellar examples of what our students can go off in the world and, and do. And as I said, I'm very proud of them. And just to show you a couple of pictures, which they're going to show you a lot more, uh, the air team uh, spent a lot of time working on air quality above the city of La Paz uh, on, the re on this revolutionary new transport, uh, the Teleferico for, for La Paz. And then uh, I had to show a picture of uh, Vernon just about to uh, plunge under the waves here of this river, <laughs> sampling water and some some very challenging conditions. Um, and uh, yeah, again, just thank you so much for spending uh, your semester uh, working hard on this, on this work. It was a great experience for me as well. Okay, so I'd ask the air team to come up, please. Uh, they're gonna go first. <coughs> I'm Jeremy Nichols. Uh, we did a transportation assessment focusing on air quality down in La Paz, and we're going to talk to you about that today. Okay, so what kind of primed this research was the fact that there are currently under development the new Sustainable Development Goals. These are a revised version of the 2000 Millennium Development Goals that were put together by a UN Council. They kind of covered a whole bunch of different aspects ranging from human health to sustainability and clean energy. Um, and what's really important about these goals is one that applies to us, is urban air quality. So one of the indicators that is proposed for these new sustainable development goals is a monitoring network 
that is present in any urban area with a population of greater than 250,000 people. Um, they want to monitor PM2.5, which for those who do not know this particular matter, it has a particle size smaller than 2.5 microns, it's very small. PM2.5 is particularly important because you actually inhale it into the deep lungs and it is not removed by natural processes, so it can cause long-term health effects. It's estimated that over a million people are affected by poor uh, urban air, ambient air quality, and these health effects are seen in emphysema, uh, lung disease, and other long-term respiratory illnesses. The problem with this monitoring network that has been currently proposed is it's cost prohibitive for many of these municipalities, especially in the lower to middle income countries, where they may not have the resources necessary to have full grade scientific equipment monitoring on a long-term scale. Currently in La Paz, there's three cities that make up the metro area, one of which is over this population threshold. Um, there's other cities throughout the country that are coming closer, you know, surpassing this 250,000 population benchmark. And especially in those that are not in the urban environment or not in the main capitals, they just don't have the people, manpower, money, or other resources necessary to do any kind of long-term monitoring. So we partnered, uh, as Dr. Brown said, with the Universidad Mayor de San Andreas, also known as UMSA. Um, so we actually had some Skype conferences with them before we went down there so we could talk about what problems they currently see with transportation and pollution in the city. They informed us that traffic is, is pretty rough and there really is uh, the huge amount of vehicles and commuter traffic that is the cause of most of the pollution problems down in the pods. So with this in mind, we decided to form our research around the different transportation modes that are available in the city. There's a huge variety of them. Car ownership is, I think, 68 per thousand people, so it's really low. Pretty much everybody there takes public transport. Um, and all these old cars are, are really poorly regulated and belch all kinds of nasty exhaust, as you'll see in some later pictures. The main byproducts of combustion, and particularly incomplete combustion, are particulate matter, black carbon, and carbon monoxide. The health risks of particulate matter and carbon monoxide are well known. And black carbon acts as kind of an indicator for particulate matter. It's under that same category. So with these three pollutants in mind, the three major point source combustion pollutants, we wanted to focus on low-cost monitoring equipment that we could take down there, bring with us on all these different forms of transport, and kind of get a big picture idea of what the circumstances are like. All the, all the transportation modes in Bolivia. So, as Jeremy mentioned, one of the main components of this project is using low-cost equipment. And we used uh, three different types of equipment while we were in La Paz. The first one being the dilos, which me measures particulate matter. And then the second is the micro which measures black carbon. And then lastly is the uh, Lascar EL USB, which measures carbon monoxide. And uh, we chose to monitor these uh, three pollutants because they are all byproducts of combustion in cars. And since La Paz does have such a large population and such a small compact area, this means that there are a lot of cars on the road which increases the concentration of pollutants in the atmosphere. And this can be really damaging to the health of the residents and also of the environment itself. So while in La Paz, we uh, came across a couple of limitations. As you guys all know, all of this research was conducted over spring break, so we only had five or six days to take the data we wanted to. And since we were primarily focused on rush hour, we only had a couple of hours in the morning and a couple hours in the evening to take the data we really needed to take. And also um, the battery life was definitely a limiting factor because uh, sometimes we would be taking measurements and the equipment we were using would actually die. So here's a picture of Francesca and our lovely TA Heidi working on a low cost air sensor that a graduate student at Tech has actually, actually developed. And it's uh, kind of in the prototype stage, and the TSA probably was suspicious a little about it because it looks kind of like a bomb. So we got to La Paz, we're like super jet lagged, and we realized that the TSA had kind of rummaged through our box and unplugged a lot of the wires. So we spent our first couple hours in La Paz um, trying to reconnect everything so we could use it for the upcoming week. And uh, so the first day of the week, we went to go meet our partners at UMSA. Uh, and they showed us around the university, which was gorgeous, and they showed us their labs and all of the resources they had. And they took us to uh, the Department of Physics, and we actually got to watch them launch a weather balloon, which was really great. And this is a picture of another piece of equipment they have. Uh, it's called the LIDAR. 
and it uh, measures the amount of particulate in the air by reflecting la lasers off the particulate. And again, I just want to reiterate how great it was to be able to use their resources and share our resources with the university because they really helped us accomplish all of our goals for the week. And uh, surprisingly enough, we did actually get to have a little bit of fun while we were there. Uh, one day we actually went to Lake Titicaca, and as we were leaving, Emily and Francesca came across a wedding reception, and these men actually just kind of drugged them into this dancing circle and started dancing with them to traditional Bolivian music, and it was just a really awesome sight to see. And here's more picture of the culture. Uh, one day we came across this parade, and these women are obviously dressed in traditional Bolivian clothes, you can tell by the hat. And I think one thing that we really enjoyed about this trip is that not only were we passionate about the research we were doing, but we were also immersed in a very unique culture in like an extremely beautiful country. Okay, so this is a picture of us at Chacotaya, which is a mountain lab that our partner university has. And it's actually uh, 5,000 meters above sea level, which is approximately three miles. And they use this lab to take background measurements of PM to compare that to the concentrations of pollutants in the city of La Paz itself. And this picture really has a huge impact on us because it shows uh, the effects climate change can really have on the environment. It's probably hard for you guys to believe, but this actually used to be a really high altitude ski slope and there used to be a glacier to the right here, but it's completely disappeared because of these pollutants that we have been examining in our research. Okay, so that leads us to the results of our research. And this is just um, a quick look at uh, the Chapultaya. Uh, when we were up at the mountain lab, we actually got the opportunity to mount some of our low cost equipment alongside the equipment that the, uh, our partners use um, for their background data. And uh, this was the results we got from uh, while we were up there. And as you can see, um, we have a really low line for the carbon monoxide pretty much all through the middle. And there's only uh, these big peaks here at the beginning and also at the end. And these peaks are actually, uh, we figured out later, uh, strictly from the one van that arrived with us to the mountain lab and uh, our departure in that van. So it's pretty incredible to see the difference that uh, just one vehicle makes in such a pristine environment, um, let alone considering the thousands of vehicles that are uh, moving about in an urban uh, place such as La Paz. So um, with that in mind, our main pursuit was comparing different modes of transportation, specifically ground transportation, as well as the really unique and special uh, transport La Paz has, the cable car system known as the Teleferico. Uh, just some background on the Teleferico, Teleferico, just because it is such a new form of transit, um, it's a cable car system as strictly unique to La Paz, and a lot of the reason they uh, implemented this system has to do with the geography of La Paz. I guess the best way to describe it is La Paz is uh, located in the bottom of a bowl, and there's another city known as El Alto, uh, which is located along the rim of this bowl, and commute between these two cities is very large. Many people who live in El Alto, which is primarily residential, uh, work every day in La Paz, so they're traveling there morning and evening um, to go to work and return home. Before the Teleferico, there was only one road in and out, so uh, obviously traffic was very bad uh, to say the least. So uh, luckily, with the building of the Teleferico, people are able to uh, go into work and return home a lot more efficiently, and it's really cool to ride. We have the opportunity. Um, you can tell this from this picture, it almost goes up vertically on some of the walls over 100 feet. Um, very smooth, comfortable ride uh, between the two cities. Uh, currently, there are three lines, the yellow, green, and red, and for our purposes, we focus mainly on the yellow line, uh, which is a portion of uh, the commute between La Paz and El Alto. So with this um, unique form of transport in mind, uh, we wanted to focus on transit and comparing personal exposure. And for our hypothesis, um, because the Teleferico was such a unique opportunity to study, um, our hypothesis was that the Teleferico would have substantially lower amounts of personal exposure for our commuter when compared to other forms of common ground transportation. So we wanted to compare the major transit forms um, with the Teleferico, of course, and ground transport, walking, car, a microbus, which is um, a really large form of public transit that people in the pods use. You can see it up here in this picture. Um, as well as uh, some new diesel buses that were just implemented in the city, um, which you can see in this lovely picture our friend Ali got to take while monitoring some PM. <laughs> 
Uh, and for the personal exposure, um, as Chelsea and Jeremy have already mentioned, we wanted to focus on the main pollutants from combustion, uh, particular matter, carbon monoxide, and black carbon, and focus mainly on uh, peak hours of travel, uh, morning and evening rush hour. Uh, so here's a first look at some of our results. Um, this was a commute that a couple of our members took, uh, just straight time, like they ran this the entire time and took a number of forms of transport to see what the results would be. And this focused on carbon monoxide. So this first blue peak that you see is um, two of our members traveling from La Paz up to El Alto in a car. The purple line in the middle that's pretty much at zero and negligible values uh, was a ride on the Teleferico from El Alto back down to La Paz. And the final peaks of gray that you see at the end are uh, walking from that Teleferico station to a downtown central area of La Paz. Um, so it's really interesting to note the huge peaks that you see in the two forms of ground transportation, the car and walking at either end, and the really negligible amounts of uh, the Teleferico um, exposure from carbon monoxide. So here are the results of our data for black carbon concentrations, and it's organized by mode of transportation. So of course you have the Teleferico, walking car, microbus, and diesel bus, and the concentrations were measured in micrograms per meters cubed. And um, it's very obvious to see the Teleferico by far had the lowest concentrations, with walking coming in as a, a close second. And the vehicular modes of transport um, were really across the board, the ranges were pretty similar. Um, but we saw some really huge peaks, uh, such as in the car, uh, 147 micrograms per meters cube, which was pretty incredible. And here's particulate matter concentrations, again, organized by form of transport and in micrograms per meters cubed. And we've also included um, some standards for reference, the WHO standards for particulate matter, both the annual and 24-hour standards, just to give you an idea of how bad uh, some of the exposure on some of these transports are. But luckily enough, the Teleferico, again, is very far on the lower end in comparison to the other forms, um, with the diesel bus being uh, very high in forms of exposure. And uh, lastly, here's the carbon monoxide concentrations. And these concentrations were actually uh, measured in parts per million. And uh, again, we've uh, provided some uh, reference lines. Uh, these are actually the National Ambient Air Quality Standards from the EPA, because WHO does not uh, have uh, carbon monoxide standards. Um, but the Televerico is pretty much at zero, which is incredible. Um, as you saw in those graphs, uh, the previous graph showing the Televerico, all the readings we took for carbon monoxide were extremely negligible, if not zero, for a lot of the measuring, which is great. Um, car and microbus, very high for carbon monoxide. I know when a couple of us were in a microbus, we experienced some pretty severe headaches when on it, so we actually got uh, our own experience of personal exposure on that ride. And here's just a comparison of all three together, black carbon and PM2.5 on the two top graphs and carbon monoxide here on the bottom. And as you can see, overall, the Teleferico is by far um, the lowest in terms of personal exposure for all three pollutants. So not only were we excited about this because our hypothesis uh, was supported, but also um, the country itself was excited and we got to share our results. Um, we got to meet with the the head leader for the Me Teleferico company, as well as take part in a press conference um, involving national news uh, channels. And a few of our um, team members even got to be personally interviewed, which was a really cool experience. And here's just a look at the Me Teleferico website after we completed our uh, research. They were uh, just so supportive of what we were doing, and we were really excited um, to be able to share our results and that uh, they were as excited for the work we're doing as we are. And uh, we were just so excited to be able to take part in this unique form of transportation. Okay. Um, now we can explore the actual impacts of our results that um, the Google Media people can experience. Here we have a pretty simple tool that shows unit personal exposure um, for the five forms of transportation that we studied. Um, it will allow an average commuter to pretty easily determine their personal exposure based on their daily commute. Um, and what we did is we calculated the average um, particulate matter and PC mass that you would inhale per minute while you're riding each of these five forms of transportation, as well as the average um, CO in parts per million. And as you can see, like what was shown in the results, the Teleferico is 
by far the lowest in terms of personal exposure, followed by walking. And using this, you can also now um, calculate time as well. So um, we did a little example for this uh, for a commute that we took a few times while in Bolivia. And it's from our hotel to the um, El Alto International Airport. And we compared two different forms of transportation getting to the airport. The first one is the car, which is the red line on that map. And that commute is about 35 minutes, and we compared it to the Teleferico, which for the Teleferico, you have to go, you have to walk from the hotel to the tel Teleferico, which is about a four minute walk, and then take the Teleferico, which is a 34 minute ride, and then um, drive from the last Teleferico stop to the airport, which is about an 18 minute drive. And then these are the results from the comparison. Um, the commute using the Teleferico is across the board, obviously much lower than when using just a car. And these are some really important results for the people in La Paz, because this isn't just a commute that they'll be taking once or twice. This is a commute that they may be doing once or twice every day. So over time, um, this decrease in exposure using the Teleferico can be pretty significant, and especially since so many people in La Paz are now using the Teleferico, this decrease of exposure can lead to um, a pretty significant increase in health in the general public of La Paz. Um, and so we would definitely have to recommend the Teleferico for people who are looking to decrease their personal exposure to pollutants. Um, it's definitely a viable solution for the people in La Paz because the cost of the teleferico is actually about the same price or even lower than most other forms of transportation in the area. However, right now it's not always super accessible or convenient for everyone. Um, you can see by the increase of time like from the hotel to the airport, the commute was much longer using the teleferico than with a car. Um, but the teleferico is in the process of um, designing and constructing a bunch more lines than um, what is currently constructed to um, include all of the dotted lines that you can see on the map. So it's in the process of becoming much more accessible and convenient for the people. Um, so in conclusion, our trip was a total success, we think. Um, we had an amazing time there. And also our hypothesis that the teleferico really is much better in terms of um, personal exposure was supported. Um, secondly, we see that um, we see our project as a kind of proof of concept that um, low-cost sensors can be used to give um, meaningful results in data, and also that um, this may be a good method to. Uh, reach the sustainable development goals of um, monitoring uh, high population cities. Um, there definitely needs to be more research in this area, but we think that our project was a good first step in this direction. Um, lastly, we would like to give a huge thank you for all of the people that made this project possible. We really couldn't have done it without you guys. Um, also, thank you to everyone who came here today, um, and that concludes our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have, I have one. Uh, when is the Teleferico uh, will undergo those expansions? Please repeat the question from the podium so that people listening can hear you. He asked uh, when the Teleferico was going to see those expansions that we talked about. Um, well, they're currently building a blue line, I believe, right now. So they're okay. in the process of constructing them right now, but it's over a period of a few years. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. I think the answer I got uh, from a local's perspective was they're going to keep looking into it after the elections. So it's probably a pretty politically charged um, project that they're working on down there. Cool. Yes, sir.
for low cost sensors, then it works. And we actually uh, use the similar uh, equipment um, because that's what uh, Heidi um, and uh, Professor Bergen uh, proposed. So, just kind of curious, how do you like verify this proof of concept uh, until you compare the result of these low cost sensors to uh, other equipment uh, that uh, um, uh, are presumable? So, did you guys do any comparison? We we actually got the chance to do a little comparison while at the um, the Umsa labs, as well as when we were up on Chakotaya. And um, we're we don't have the graphs physically with us, but we got to see the live readouts while we were there, and they were very similar, um, especially for black carbon. The dilos was a little a little off, but for black carbon and um, Carbon monoxide was also, it, it's, the ones they had were more sensitive for the lower amounts of carbon monoxide. Ours kind of had a, uh, I don't know, it wouldn't, it didn't pick up low amounts as, as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca had a question. Oh, I already asked it. It was just, or piped into the home. But the issue with that is that I can have a source that's piped into my home, but it can still be contaminated with fecal matter. So it can still have E. coli in it, and it can still be considered unsafe, and I can still get sick from having this pipe source. So <clears throat> even after this goal was accomplished, uh, 748 million people still lacked access to clean, safe, clean and safe drinking water. And so with that, uh, they came back together and are working on the sustainable development goals. Which Jamie talked about earlier. 
Um, and the one of these that we want to look at for the water team is to achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. So this means global, worldwide, in homes, in schools, and in public health facilities, everybody has clean drinking water. Um, so the definition for this here is a microbiological water quality test. For this, the indicator is E. coli, which um, indicates fecal contamination in your water, and fecal contamination is kind of a big thing that is an indicator for why people get sick. Um, and so we want to take that out. So the proposed safe benchmark for clarifying if there's uh, not too much fecal contamination in your water is 10 colony 400 units of E. coli per 100 milliliters of water. So that means if I took a 100 milliliter water sample, I would have 10 colonies of E. coli forming. And anything less than that is a pretty safe bet for drinking water. This number is still under proposal. It could go down to one, uh, but this is what we used. So, and this goal is to be accomplished by the year 2030. Um, so that was when everybody should have sustainable, clean drinking water, um, which would be awesome. So, our objective as a team, uh, we needed, we wanted to decide what's needed to move towards these sustainable development goals. Uh, and we came up with the idea, really Dr. Brown came up with the idea that a water quality test is needed to measure up to 10 colony forming units per, of E. coli per 100 mils of water. Um, it's something that's widely adaptable or affordable, easy to use, and requires minimal technology. This is, necess uh, this is a necessity because it's got to be used in places like Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, all around the world, and you need to be able to have it transfer pretty easily. Um, so the good news is that the PA test kits that we're looking at for this experiment meet these requirements. Um, but the big question is, are they accurate for field use? So our goal as a team was to go to Bolivia and look at, do the PA test kits, or are they accurate um, when compared to standard methods? So to look at that, in our preparation, we determined our question and determined our test. So we're going to compare the PA test kits, which you see here, with the membrane filtration and a test called the 3M Petri film, which is currently in use in countries. Um, it's pretty easy to get those tests because 3M will send them to you for free, so they're a cheap alternative to really expensive membrane filtration right now. Um, and we also wanted to look at different incubation methods because a standard incubation method can also be costly and require lots of lab equipment. We're trying to look for something that doesn't need that. So, Memory filtration, we just looked at standard incubation. The PA test kits, we looked at standard and ambient incubation, which means just leaving the tests out in like an open air room temperature room to incubate over time and seeing how accurate they are after a set amount of time. We did that as well with the three and petri films. And the point of our trip was to compare all those things. Uh, other preparation and quarter, uh, included ordering lab equipment. Uh, preparing PA test kits for on-site use, which I'm doing in the bottom corner here. We prepared about a thousand of them, I think the two weeks before we left, and it was a lot of work. Um, we practiced our lab techniques for when we got to the field, and we learned about Bolivian culture uh, by going to the Carter Center and having Dr. Jenny Lincoln talk to us, and that's this picture here. Um, and we also began our communication with our in-country partners, which were EIA, Engineers in Action, and the university that the air team talked about in the um, so I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Caitlin. So, we're all packed up and ready to go to Bolivia. This is a picture of us at the airport. We flew over to Bolivia. Um, this is a picture of what we saw as we were driving down from the airport into the city. Um, as the air team mentioned, uh, La Paz is located at the bottom of a bowl like landscape, and so you can see the mountain ranges surrounding the city. So, some of the first things that we saw when we got to La Paz were water tanks um, elevated on top of roofs. Many people in Bolivia uh, drink from stored water as opposed to running water. Also on the right, there's a river that's very turbid, and this is because wastewater, which is um, any kind of used water, whether from the kitchen or the bathroom or any, just, um, any other water, um, is just dumps back into the environment without having any treatment. So this can pose a health risk for the people in La Paz. So what did we do every day in La Paz? Every day, um, our team broke up into two groups, the lab group and the sample group. The lab group uh, went to the lab to test the water 
and the sample group went to different cities around Bolivia to collect those uh, samples of water which they would later give to the lab group. Okay. So, uh, Caitlin uh, formerly mentioned uh, three different kinds of water quality tests that we would be comparing in La Paz. Uh, the first one is called a presence absence test. And I brought some to show and tell. But um, here are presence absence tests. And as you can um, probably guess, uh, it's called presence absence test because if the test detects the presence of E. coli, then it turns purple. And if not, it just um, stays this uh, cloudy water color. So this test is a novel test that is being researched on here at Georgia Tech and isn't being currently used as a water quality test testing method. Um, the detection limit is 10 CFV per 100 milliliters, which makes it perfect to track for the sustainable development goals. The analysis volume is 10 milliliters, so it's really easy to use because you can either just scoop water or pour 10 milliliters, which is the um, volume of this uh, little test tube. And so it's very adaptable and it's also very affordable because it's only 56 cents per test. On the other hand, membrane filtration, uh, which is the currently uh, used standard method of um, accurate water quality tests, is uh, it has a detection limit of 1 CFU per 100 milliliters. This means that it can detect down to lower concentrations than the PA test kits. The analysis volume is a little bit more, it's 100 milliliters, um, but you can only do about 16 tests per day in the field, and it requires sophisticated lab equipment as shown above, and it's really expensive. It's um, compared to the PA test kits, it's $15 per test. And so it wouldn't be very adaptable, it wouldn't be very affordable worldwide, although it is very accurate. Lastly, the Petri foam is uh, a little bit of an in-between test because it is um, it is a little bit easier to use and a little bit more affordable. <coughs> the Petri foam test is currently the low cost um, and widely used water quality testing method. Um, However, however, the detection limit is 100 CFU per 100 milliliters, and this would not be useful in tracking for the uh, sustainable development goals. The analysis volume is also one milliliter, um, and so that might be a little bit harder to measure, which is just a few drops of water, so it's a little bit harder to measure than what you would put in a PA test kit, but a lot easier um, in terms of lab equipment needed uh, with a membrane filtration test. Um, and it's also $3.46 per test, so it's an in-between cost between the PA and the membrane filtration. So I'll take you a tour to our lab um, in La Paz. So the first top two pictures are taken at OMSA, the laboratory that the university graciously allowed us to use. Um, and on the bottom here is our makeshift laboratory at the hotel which we um, tried to make sure was as clean as possible, but we had to uh, play by ear with um, the, lab, the lab that we had made at the hotel. And I'll hand it over to Bradley to explain what we did in the field. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our sampling locations and how we exactly sampled this water. So what we did is basically wherever we went around in Bolivia, we brought something called a World Pack bag which is basically a plastic bag that holds about 300 milliliters of water and has sodium thiosulfate in it. Um, and that's important because sodium thiosulfate eliminates chlorine um, to make sure that the chlorine doesn't um, kill any of the bacteria in the sample so we can get a representative sample of what the water would be like if someone ingested it at that moment. Um, so what we would do is we would try to take three samples per water source, um, put them in these World Pack bags as pictured up here, and put them in the cooler until we were able to bring them back to test them. Um, we also took note of other properties such as pH, turbidity, and temperature. Um, we had something called our lab Bible that we carried around, which is basically all our sheets so we could keep track of our samples. I'm going to talk about a little bit of each of the locations that we sampled at and why we sampled there. So first I'll talk about El Alto. So like the air team said, it's kind of the rim surrounding the Bull of La Paz. Um, and there we sampled in the reservoir um, that 
most of the water, most of the drinking water from La Paz comes from. So we sampled the reservoir as well as that, as well as the high altitude air lab that um, the air team was talking about. So we were able to take some snow samples up there. Next, we took some samples in La Paz. So one area we sampled was actually in our hotel, Hotel Calicoto. Um, and why we did that is to get a representative sample of what it would be like if we were drinking water in the hotel. Um, our team did the best, our best not to drink the water. Um, it's kind of difficult in the shower sometimes, so that was but um, <laughs> so we were able to take samples um, from the hotel as well as the engineering options. Next, um, some of the team was able to go to Copacabana, which the air team also discussed earlier, but it's a large tourist location um, around Lake Titicaca, which is actually the highest altitude lake um, in the world. And why we decided to take samples there um, is that Lake Titicaca borders both Peru and Bolivia, and some surrounding villages actually use that as their drinking water source. So we wanted to see um, what people were actually drinking around the area. Next, we went to Konani, and why we were initially interested in looking at Konani is it's an intermittent water source. So that means that the water pump isn't working 24 hours a day. Typically, intermittent sources are thought to be as dirtier, um, and so we wanted to examine that. Um, we were able to take a sample from the water tower, so the source of the water, as well as schools, homes, um, and even a medical clinic around the area. Another really cool part of our Konami trip was we were able to see the wastewater treatment plant that they were building there. Um, and finally, some of our team sampled in Sika Sika. Um, it's a municipality, and they were looking at potential drinking water sources such as springs, wells, um, you name it. They sampled out a few schools and homes as well. Um, what I want you to see here is the water on the bottom right is very visibly dirty. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Vernon to talk about culture again. So while we were sampling water, we encountered many obstacles. Uh, first, there's only one road that takes you from La Paz to the city of El Alto. And this road is common for roadblocks due to transportation shocks. Uh, so we had to arrange our travel very early to certain sites or just avoid them. Uh, second, our, we experienced some mechanical issues with our land cruiser. Uh, where our brakes got extremely hot and stopped working at times. And as shown in the picture to the right, uh, is Brandy uh, changing her first tire to get the Land Cruiser back on track. And lastly, Rebecca had an allergic reaction due to unexpected ant bites in the field. Uh, even though we worked uh, very early in the morning and very late at night, uh, we was able to get a taste of the Bolivian culture. Uh, as a group, we visited rural areas of Bolivia. Uh, some of us uh, attended Dr. Rubin's air pollution class, where we talked to the students about our research and attended graduate school, and especially attended Georgia Tech. Uh, while others attended the parade in Sika Sika. And before we left, as a group, we visited an animal refuge in the jungle. And this was a very long week. And we're, we're back in Atlanta, and the work is not over. So what's next? Uh, we needed to compile the data, analyze our results, uh, discuss our conclusion, and present our findings. And I would like to pass it off to Taryn so that she can tell you more about the results. Okay, so these maps show the locations of each of the sources where we collected samples from, and the dots showing uh, represent the risk category that each of them were in. So the green is low risk and less than one CFU per 100 mil. The yellow is medium <coughs> risk, one to 10 CFU per 100 mil, and high risk is shown in red, 11 to 100 CFU per 100 mil, and dark red is extremely high risk greater than 100 in one CFU per 100 mil. So in El Alto, which was near the reserve and a lot of kind of undisturbed environmental samples were all low risk samples. Uh, Copacabana, as we talked about, has some of the dirtiest samples, especially in Lake Titicaca. Uh, the city of Copacabana itself, although it didn't necessarily use the water from Lake Titicaca, it did have dirtier samples, medium to extreme risk. 
And these were taken from public bathrooms and restaurants around the city. Uh, in Konani, we actually found that the water was relatively clean. This one red dot right here, which is high risk, was found in a well, so it's a separate water sample from the rest of the city. And then the extreme risk right there and the medium risk were actually from pipes that had very low pressure, so we think that the pipes were disturbed somehow and some leaching and from groundwater we have contaminated the water sample. And Sika Sika, the municipality was kind of divided into six different villages or small towns. So a lot of them had very different water sources. We had a variety of results from low to extreme high risk. Um, so there was a lot of variability in Sika So this table um, talks about the consistency of petri film and presence absence tests and standard method and we use that as number filtration. So these numbers actually show the percentage that future film and presence absence tests, the percentage of future film and presence absence tests that fell in the same category that the membrane filtration. So um, the first row is actually really high because um, there are less false, uh, less false negatives or less false positives. Sorry, um, for tests that have a higher detection limit than number infiltration. Um, this is a really interesting column, and this is 24 hours, and the reason that most of them were zero is because there were actually no color change for 24 hours ambient presence and absence tests. But what I really want you to look at is that this was actually the most accurate presence and absence test result, and that was for 72 hours. So 11 to 100 CFP per 100 mil and greater than 101 CFP per 100 mil were the most accurate which kind of is consistent with what we want to show, uh, presence absence test being a good indicator for water that is dirtier than 10 CFU per 100 So let's talk about false positives and false negatives. Um, there are a lot more false negatives than false positives, which ideally you would want more false positives than false negatives if you're talking about health risks. Um, but what's interesting is this row. So for the ambient, it actually turned out after 72 hours to be more accurate than the standard incubation method, and it decreased, it increasingly decreased <laughs> throughout the time period, which could mean that after more time, um, presence absence tests can become more accurate than just the 12% false negatives. So what does this mean? All right, so if you get one take home message from all that was just presented, um, we were able to find as was our goal, that the PA test when incubated annually for 72 hours produced the most accurate results. And again, we were looking for the most accurate way to incubate these samples. So that was good news. And furthermore, if the sustainable development goal set the limit for safe drinking water to be 10 CFU per 100 milliliter, then we found that the PA test kit is low cost, easy to use, it has an appropriate lower detection limit, and based on our results, it's a very feasible method. Um, unfortunately, we had lots of limitations, including time. Uh, we were only there over spring break, and so we, had, we could only take a limited number of samples. Also, we had very long travel times to get to lots of the places that we went to, and so, again, that limited the number of samples that we could take. Um, also, we did not take data on the temperature that we were ambiently incubating, and we think that this may have given us a better understanding of our results if we had. So for future studies, and if this class continues, um, we'd like to see more data collection on ambient incubation, um, especially since we saw the trend that it became more accurate as time continued. Um, it would be interesting to record data beyond 72 hours and also stick with more strict time limits. So like, make sure that we check it after exactly 24, 70, or 48 and 72 hours. Um, also, recording the data, uh, temperature data for ambient incubation would also give a more holistic view of what's happening. So we would like to thank, I give a, I guess a big acknowledgement to Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Bergen, uh, Aaron, and Heidi for guiding us through this research project. We would like to give two big shout outs to Lorenzo for taking these awesome pictures, which are included in our presentation. Uh, Allie for the extra pair of hands. Uh, also, we would like to thank EIA for taking care of the logistics while in Bolivia. 
and Humsa for providing us the lab space to use. Uh, we are extremely grateful for this course, and we would like to uh, thank the Money Fund uh, for funding us and for the opportunity. Uh, also, we would like to thank Dr. Lincoln from the Carter Center for sharing key information about Bolivia's history and culture uh, prior to departure. Uh, and last but not least, we would like to thank the folks from the CEE Communication Department uh, for their media guidance. Dr. Brown's Water Research Group, and the water, wonderful citizens of Bolivia uh, for welcome, welcoming us to the city. Because this was an awesome trip. And one of the key things that stuck with me uh, while coming back to Atlanta was that I gained insight on what to do after graduating from college. Um, I'd say my main takeaway was the value of engaging with the local population because we have a lot to learn from people of different cultures. I learned the importance of detail, like knowing the local culture and values and the relationships. I learned that what works here doesn't necessarily work everywhere and that you have to be really mindful of other cultures and what they want you to do and kind of step into their role to do it. I really learned that getting to know people for who they are as people and not just group members and co-workers or clients is really important and really actually leads to the productivity of your projects. I learned that I can better the human condition by volunteering my knowledge and experience as a hell of an engineer. Questions? Are those llamas or alpacas or vicuñas? It's a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, uh, do we get a 50-50? <laughs> 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 yeah, the, those are llamas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, this picture uh, we took at the reservoir uh, in El Alto. And uh, I guess while driving in our land cruiser, I guess we got was able to get a close shot of one of the llamas, and particularly this one, he kind of caught back, <laughs> wanted, to, wanted to spit, uh, so he drove off. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Uh, we have a question. Oh, go, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. We've enjoyed listening to it. Um, I'm a senior here at Yale University Medical School. Uh, I had a question about the Petrofilm uh, tests. I uh, wanted to know why you chose to, to use Petrofilm um, if the detection limit was above the SGD uh, standards and why you think it became more accurate as time progressed. I, I know the 72 hour data seemed much more accurate than, say, the 24 hour data. Thank you. Thank you. I'll repeat the question. Um, the yeah. question was uh, why did we choose Petri film if it was, um, if if the lower detection limit was higher than what the SDG had proposed, and why the results seem to um, uh, be different after 70, after 72 hours of incubation. Yeah, so um, the PA test actually became more accurate at 72, and that's mostly because you can't really have false, really a lot of false positives with the presence absence test. The Petri film actually um, were kind of problematic after 48 hours of ambient incubation. And that's um, not really compared to the memory filtration, but maybe the Petri film standard. So basically after 48 hours, the Petri film kind of like took off with its colonies. Um, so I think after a lot of incubation um, with kind of colony counting methods, it's gonna be an issue because you're not gonna get a good representation of what risk category it belongs to, but for a presence absence test, I think it would be accurate no matter what the time period is. And also, we chose Petri film because um, it's widely used by EIA, that's Engineers in Action. Um, so, and it's also widely available to students. You can actually get a certain number number for free, and so it's it's what's currently in use in a lot of these low and middle income. Thank you so much. Are there any more questions? I don't have a question, but I would like to make one comment. So, um, uh, 
congratulations on all the great work. I was very impressed by all the uh, work that you guys did. I uh, just wanted to, to uh, you know, uh, say that you know it was great to see some of the familiar names there. Um, you know, um, especially Heidi, uh, who traveled with me uh, two years ago, and you know he was really Heidi who started the air work with me, and now uh, it's becoming a bigger scale. So that's uh, really uh, you know uh, impressive, and also you know uh, it's really touching to me. Also, it's good to see Aaron. You know, Aaron took my course in the past, so um, and he's now the leading group in the water. That is also amazing. I see also a couple of names that I recognize: Ellie George and Melissa Meyer. Uh, Melissa, I think we met. Uh, is it two years ago, or three years ago, when she was a freshman? Uh, we met in Nicaragua when she was doing me about the work, and she uh, shared those, uh, shared with my class. And then, um, uh, and then I guess uh, you kind of uh, more interested in this uh, you know, type of class, and now you are doing it. So it's just amazing to see you know, all the students doing uh, what they were uh, interested in doing. So um, okay, I just wanted to say this that uh, thank you for all the great work um, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, I just want to I want to thank everybody um, for, for doing such a great job of this. I thank thank all the students. Um, definitely thanks to uh, our supporters again, and thanks for the professors who, who agreed to um, to uh, mentor these groups. And thanks a lot to the TAs again. This has been a great experience, and I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I had a great time, and I hope you did too. Um, any final comments from from Yale, or, or, or can we sign off? Right. So um, you know. Um presentation next Thursday, uh, April 30th from Club to one and we will have the, uh, the video set up ready for you guys and hope uh, you uh, can find time to join us. Okay, um, I, hope, I hope you'll be able to, yeah. Um, that sounds good. Did I get that? Did you hear that in your video? Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys. Um, take care, Yale, and okay. we'll see you next week. See you. Okay, bye bye. All right, thanks everybody. Good. <laughs> 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 <laughs>